Well, I have the privilege this morning to introduce our speaker. Stefan Gustafsson is with us this morning from Stockholm, Sweden, and he is an author, a professor, a director of ministries, and he's also the leading Christian apologist in the Nordic countries. He's the co-founder of the European Leadership Forum, which is familiar to many of us. We have sent mission teams uh, to Hungary originally and now to Poland each year to serve at the European Leadership Forum. And we've been a, really a significant in partnership with that ministry in order to unite and to equip and to resource Christian leaders throughout Europe. I met uh, Stefan probably over a dozen years ago in Hungary when I was serving there uh, on a team at the European Leadership Forum. And uh, from that time all the way until this, I have really been grateful for and impressed by his godly character and his genuine love for the Lord and his visionary leadership and a razor-sharp mind. So there's just much to appreciate about this man. He's been here before uh, and preached. He uh, led a seminar yesterday on apologetics, and he's truly a friend of Zionsville Fellowship. So Stefan, come on up and let's welcome him. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's uh, such a privilege for me to be back here. It's, uh, uh, it's such a joy to be welcomed by you all here, the way you have uh, done that. And I also want to say a huge thank you for uh, your involvement in European Leadership Forum. That has been, uh, as you heard, a long, a long story, and it's been so important for the uh, work in Europe. So uh, thank you so much for your support and your involvement in uh, the kingdom work in Europe. The theme this morning uh, is come and see. And uh, in a few minutes time, we will read a text from John's Gospel, chapter one. But let me say a few things as an introduction. Maybe some of you have seen uh, this, uh, this quote. Christianity began as a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. When it went to Athens, it became a philosophy. When it went to Rome, it became an organization. When it went to Europe, it became a culture. When it came to America, it became a business. So, a lot of things has happened during history. But it all began, Christianity, the Christian movement, it began as a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So, how do you enter into that kind of relationship? How do you become a Christian? The message this morning is for you who are not a Christian, how can you investigate into the Christian faith? It is a message for you who are on the way to become a Christian. And it, it is a message for us who are already Christians in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. How can we invite other people to discover what is now the center of our lives. Of course, as Christians, we know that God is the one who is searching for us. God is calling us to himself, so he is always there first. But there is also a human side of us searching for him. And we are going to focus on that aspect today. A lot of Christians, I think, would relate to Mark's, uh, to Mark's gospel, chapter 1, when thinking about how did people originally enter into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? If we think of the first disciples of Jesus, in Mark chapter 1, verse 16 to 20, we can read this. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. 
Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had got a little uh, further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father, Zebedee, in the boat with the hired men and followed him. And I've heard countless sermons using this text and describing the situation. Here's those fishermen uh, uh, dealing with a net in the boat, and there are people walking along the, uh, along the beach, and there's a man, man coming over there, and nothing strange. People like to walk along uh, the shore. But when he comes closer, this stranger, this unknown man, they are just fascinated by him and gradually become almost hypnotized by him. And when he is just in front of them, there's this deep voice saying, follow me. And they just drop everything and start to follow him. That's how their discipleship started. And I remember I was quite young, sitting in a church, thinking, that sounds really strange. Who on earth will do that? Shouldn't we, shouldn't we be warning against that, that kind of, of choice to just start to follow an unknown stranger who commands you to follow him? So what's going on here? Were Jesus kind of putting them into a kind of hypnosis? Had he kind of mind control over them? So he could, he could make them do really strange things, such as dropping everything and start to follow him. No, Jesus is not using mind controlling techniques. He's not putting people into a trance to have them to follow him. I'm really glad that the Gospel of John gives us the prehistory to this event. Something has happened before what Mark is telling us in his first chapter. And John is giving us the full story, what went on before. So let's read the text for today. That's John chapter 1, verse 35 to 51. The next day, John, that is John the Baptist, was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying and spent that day with him. It was about the tenth hour. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which, when translated, is Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote Jesus of Nazareth the son of Joseph Nazareth can anything good come from there Nathaniel asked come and see said Philip when Jesus saw Nathaniel approaching he said of him here is a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false how do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said, 
You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You shall see greater things than that. He then added, I tell you the truth. You shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Lord, I pray that you will open your word for us and that you will open us, our minds and our hearts, our will for your word. Amen. So, our text starts with John the Baptist. And he has several disciples. And he has been proclaiming now The Lord will come. Prepare the way for the Lord. Now, promises of the Old Testament will become true. And he had called the people of Israel to repent. And he had baptized them in, uh, in Jordan. And they were waiting for God's inbreak into history. And then when Jesus comes, John points to him saying, look, there's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is the chosen one. So he realizes that this is the person he had been preparing the way for. And he directs some of his disciples to start to follow Jesus. Notice in this text, what followed then is a text about investigation Jesus. To try to find out who this man is. Twelve times you will find the words see or saw or looking. So it, it is about take a really good look at who Jesus is. It is about finding out things. It tells about people staying with Jesus to learn from him. And it ends with people start to follow him. So here I think we have some really important clues about how you can investigate who Jesus is in order to see if you should enter into a personal relationship with him. Three simple points in the sermon. First, the invitation. What we have read is about five disciples' first contact with Jesus. And that was not in the boat along the shore of the Sea of Galilee. It was here. Five people in the first contact with Jesus. It, it's Andrew and then another one, an anonymous disciples. We are not giving the name, strangely enough. I think a good guess, but it's absolutely just a guess, it is that it's the author of the gospel itself is it is the apostle john why because he gives some so uh, detailed historical information the text gives us the hour when they came to the house of jesus so maybe uh, it is john it's a guess it's andrew and another disciple and then it's peter who is invited and then it's philip and he invites Nathaniel. So five people in their first encounter with Jesus. And it's so almost comical. John the Baptist says to his disciples, there is the Lamb of God, follow him. Okay, so they do that. And Jesus is walking and they walk behind. And Jesus realizes there's someone behind me, so he stops and says, what do you want? <laughs> That's a question to have from Messiah. What do you want? And they seem a little bit unsure in the situation. So they ask what's almost a stupid question. What's your address? Where do you live? <laughs> okay, come on and see. Maybe it's not a stupid question. Maybe the, the point of it is What's your kind of base camp? Because we want to get to know you. We want to hear from you. 
Where are you located? Because we want to be with you. John the Baptist had told us we should follow you. So here we are. And Jesus is really relaxed. Come on and see. And they went home to him and they stay with him and it starts four o'clock in the afternoon. There you have the, the hour, the tenth hour. And they stay with Jesus. Can we guess what kind of conversations they had? They were not discussing the weather. <laughs> you know, they, the disciples have listened to John the Baptist saying, prepare the way for the Lord. And then pointed to Jesus. So of course they had this, had, have had better questions than what's your address? Who are you? What's your ministry? What are you doing or want to do here in Israel? So they listened to him and talked with him and started to get to know him. And they are really enthusiastic. So, Andrew, as soon as he can, invites Peter. You have to come and see. We have found him. And the next day, Jesus bumps into Philip. And he becomes really enthusiastic. After getting to know a little bit about Jesus and listening to him. And he invites Nathanael, come and see. And people start to gather around Jesus. So I, I hope you see the sequence here. At least some of the, the disciples were prepared by John the Baptist. So they have had a process of starting to think about God's promises to Israel, to think about Messiah. And then Jesus enters the scene, and they are invited to, by Jesus, come and see, come and stay with me. And they followed him home, they listened to his teaching, and they got to know him at least a little bit as a person. And then they are challenged. Follow me. What happened at the shore of the Sea of Galilee is that Jesus is coming along the, uh, the beach. And they know him. They've been at his home. They have listened to him. And what Mark chapter 1 is about is their formal calling to be one of his closest followers to become his uh, team workers to join him in that sense of leaving their occupation as fishermen a lot of people who became disciples of Jesus did not leave their occupation were not chosen to be among the twelve or, or uh, this close group just around Jesus who followed him all around in Judea and Galilee and so on you could be a disciple and, of course, stay in your occupation and with your family and so on. In Mark 1, Jesus is calling them specifically, I want you to be in my core group and be, be key persons in this mission of fishing for people. So it's not a blind decision. He is not a stranger. They know something. And they choose to follow Jesus. Secondly, the challenge. So several times there is this invitation, come and see, come and explore, investigate, listen, ask questions. That's implied in that. But when, when Jesus is talking to Philip, there is also a real challenge. So he calls Philip, follow me. Be my disciple. And this is really important. Christianity and the gospel message is open for investigation. You can look into it before you become a Christian in order to know what it is to become a Christian. But there is also a moment for decision. You need to take a stand for or against. You need to bow before the Lord or continue your own way. 
And Philip is challenged. Maybe we can think of it in terms of, is the Jesus movement a fan club? Or is it more like a marriage to become a disciple of Jesus? You can join a fan club and really admire a pop star or a uh, uh, athlete and you're part of the fan club and you, you really admire and you, you like to see and listen but it does not affect much of your own life. There's not much real commitment. You continue to live your life and that adds some extra joy and excitement but you are only part of the fan club. A marriage is something very, very different. You're committed, committing yourself for the rest of your life with everything you have to another person. You are joined to that person. So that's a huge difference. Too many people think of Christianity in the church as a fan club. You can join that club and you, you can admire certain things and, and it gives you joy in some aspects of your life and so on. But that's not Christianity. It is to be joined to, related to Jesus Christ. And there is a decisive moment where you need to, to answer that calling. Follow me. I like how uh, Francis Schaeffer, already back in the 1960s, uh, phrased this. He said it like this. He said, for, for a man, for a, a person to become a Christian, you need to bow twice. You need to bow down twice in order to become a Christian. Here is how he formulated it. First, he needs to bow in the realm of being, that is, metaphysically. That is, to acknowledge that he is a creature before the infinite personal creator who is there. You need to bow first, and this is extra relevant in our secular culture. You need to bow in the realm of being, metaphysically, to acknowledge that God is God and you are not God. He is the sovereign and you are totally dependent. You cannot be autonomous any longer. You need to bow before God as the creator. Second, he needs to bow in the realm of morals. That is, to acknowledge that he has sinned and therefore he has true guilt before the God who is there. If he has true moral guilt before an infinite God, he has the problem that he, as finite, has no way to remove such a guilt. Thus what he needs is a non-humanist solution. And now he's faced with God's propositional promise, believe on the Lord Jesus and thou shall be saved. So you need to bow before God a second time and acknowledge your own guilt, your own brokenness, your sin. And acknowledge that you yourself cannot repair that. You yourself cannot solve your problem. You need a non-human, non-humanistic solution. And that is what the gospel offers us. That Jesus he is the Lamb of God who has taken away our sin. So Philip is challenged to bow before Jesus and start to follow him. But it is not a blind faith. You see how in their dialogue with each other, Philip and Nathaniel and Andrew and Peter, they are referring to scripture. We have found the one Moses wrote about, and whom the prophet also wrote about. So they see that Jesus fits in to the revelation from God, to all the prophetic promises, so they can understand at least something of who he is. So as Christians and as a church, we need to invite people to investigate very openly, come and see. And then... We need also to challenge people to follow Jesus 
and to make a decision. I don't know if you have, any of you have read the book A Severe Mercy by Sheldon Vonneken. Uh, he uh, was an interesting person. He was a close friend to C.S. Lewis. Uh, and in the book, this actually included a number of uh, letters from C.S. Lewis, Lewis to Sheldon. And Sheldon was not a Christian. And he distanced himself from the Christian faith. But th through, amongst other things, the uh, uh, contact with C.S. Lewis draw him closer to the gospel. And he started to investigate what is the gospel. Who is this person, Jesus of Nazareth? And he became fascinated by, by Jesus. And then he writes this in, in the book. There is a gap between the probable and the proved. How was I to cross it? He realized you cannot prove in an absolute sense the truth of Christianity, even though you can show it's probable. But there's still this gap between the probable and the proved. How was I to cross it? If I were to stake my whole life on the risen Christ, I wanted proof, I wanted certainty. Sounds like a very modern pe uh, person. I wanted to see him eat a bit of fish. I wanted letters of fires across the sky. I got none of these. And I continued to hang about on the edge of the gap. And then he writes, it was a question of whether I was to accept him or reject him. My God, there was a gap behind me too. Perhaps the leap of acceptance was a horrifying gamble. But what of the leap to rejection? There might be no certainty that Christ was God, but by God there was no certainty that he was not. So we are in a situation there is no absolute certainty or absolute uh, proofs. You don't have that. And still, we have to make a choice. We make to have to make a step. And he realized it's a huge step to reject Jesus Christ. It is as big as to accept him. But again, to accept him, to take that step, is not a blind step. It's not a leap of faith. It is a step you can take on good and sufficient reasons and acknowledge that Jesus is who he said he was. Thirdly, the adventure. The last person that is introduced to Jesus is Nathaniel. And he is an interesting character because he is so skeptical. <laughs> when Philip comes full of enthusiasm, wow, let me tell you about Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth. What? Can anything good come from Nazareth? If it's God's dealing, it, it should come from Jerusalem. Come on. What has Nazareth to do with with God's promises to Israel. So he is. He has his preconception of what the truth must be. But still, Philip managed to invite him to Jesus. And then Jesus says something amazing. Here is a true Israelite. Here is a true Israelite. And then Nathaniel is interpreting that as kind of flattery. What, what is this? You have, never, you have never met me. You don't know who I am. Are you trying to flatter me into obedience to you? Well, what's going on? You don't know me. Why are you saying these things? So you see, he has a really skeptical attitude. Most of us, if someone would say such a nice thing, we would just, whoa, what a nice person. He's saying those nice things about me. But not Nathaniel. He is really a skeptic in his attitude. And then Jesus said, because he says, how do you know me? And Jesus said, I saw you when you were sitting under the fig tree. Now, we don't know what, what that is, uh, what the reference there is. But we, we understand that Nathaniel recently had been sitting under, under a tree. And that has been a significant moment in his life. Maybe he had been reading from the scriptures. Maybe he had been reflecting over one of the messianic prophecies. Maybe he had been thinking, 
Wow, one day there will be one generation who will see the Messiah. Wow, think if it's in my generation that the Messiah actually will come in. Maybe he been been crying out to God in despair because of who he himself is. We don't know, but something significant. Maybe that God really touched him under the tree. So he knew something that no other human being knew. I was sitting under the tree and something significant from God happened. And now Jesus said, I saw you when you were there. And of course, Nathaniel understands, wow, I'm in the presence of the supernatural. This is not a, a human messenger only. Here is something more. So then he suddenly changes his whole attitude. <laughs> And then he exclaimed, wow, you are the Messiah, the King of, of Israel. And then Jesus is kind of, whoa, whoa, whoa. hold your horses. Are you, are you that enthusiastic because I told you about you were sitting under the tree? Wow, if you start to follow me, you will see much more wonderful thing than that. And then Jesus said, you will actually see heaven open. And he refers to Genesis 28, the story of, uh, of Jacob's dream in Bethel. You know, Jacob who was uh, fleeing from his family because of, uh, of, of what he has done. And in the dream, he sees angels climbing up and down on a ladder between heaven and earth. And Jesus is referring to that, to that text. Where when Jacob wakes up, he says, the Lord is in this place. This might, must be God's dwelling place. This is the gates of heaven. And now Jesus is saying, you are going to see the heaven open. Because now God's dwelling place is in Jesus. And now Jesus is the connection point between heaven and, and earth. Because what Jacob formulated after his dream is now really true about the Son of Man. The text is about starting to discover who Jesus is. And you can see in the text that you have, you have so many of the Christ, Christ, uh, Christological titles of Jesus. It's one, one text here. He is described as the Lamb of God. He is said to be the Messiah. He is said to be the Son of God. He is said to be the King of Israel. He is said to be the Son of Man. Did those five Men understood the full significance of what they were uh, saying here? No, absolutely not. They didn't understand the full significance. And you have to study on in the, in the Gospels to start to see more what is the meaning of those titles. But they've started to see some of the truth in those different titles. And they've seen enough of that truth truth to start to follow him and so it's for us of course we we don't see or understand or appreciate the full depth and beauty of all those five titles but to be a disciple is to start to explore that and learn more and your joy will grow in your heart the more you understand what those titles stand for how did you become a Christian? Well, if we, we start to think about it, almost all of us would be able to point to some persons that pointed us to Jesus. We think of our parents, or our good friends, or a pastor, or a youth leader, or maybe a writer through his or her book. But there is a person, or in most cases, a number of persons, 
that have directed you to Jesus. And from the human, the human side, you can trace, why am I a Christian? Well, it's a number of people that in different ways invited me to Jesus. And I've come to see at least a little bit of what this means. That's the way God has ordered it in history. The message about Jesus goes from one person to the next person. And in this text, we have seen the invitation. Come and see. From John the Baptist to Andrew. Follow. There's the Lamb of God. From Andrew to Peter. From Philip to Nathaniel. And then all through history, people have given the invitation. Come and see. And now, of course, it's for us as God's people. Now it's our turn to invite people and say, come and see. You can openly investigate to see if he is what he claims to be. That's the wonderful commission we have as disciples and as a church to invite people to Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, I want to thank you that you are searching for us and that you are calling us to yourself. And I want to thank you for the people that have been involved in our lives who have, you have used to call us to you and to explore who you are. And now I pray that we, as your people today, that you will equip us and encourage us to, to extend that invitation so more people can uh, thank you for who you are and for what you have done for us. I pray that in your precious name, Jesus. Amen.